My wife and I attended the Tesla Takeover event in California. This was a 5,449 mile road trip. So in this video, I'm gonna talk about that experience, everything we saw at the Tesla Takeover, and my advice for you if you're going on a road trip with your electric vehicle. It started with just you know, looking at the route on Google. And we saw there was a number of different routes we could take, and we actually ended up picking one that would go through uh, South Dakota, Wyoming, and then kind of down towards California. And we wanted to go through Utah and Colorado on our way back. And so using that information, I went out to ChatGPT and I just said, you know what, plan a road trip. And that was it. And so what I got back actually was a quite lengthy recommendation of all these different places that we could stop along the way. The only problem is that it was gonna take us over a month. And you know, we don't have that much time. Uh, so it was back to the drawing board. We looked over some of the recommendations and picked out things that we thought would be interesting to us. And then from there, we tried to narrow it down further. Since we'd be driving our Tesla out there, we knew that we would need to make stops along the way for charging. So I went to a better route planner, put in the different destinations along the way, and got back uh, some recommendations for places to stop and charge. We knew that we didn't want to spend more than about six hours driving and maybe an hour or so a day charging. And so we tried to use that as the limitation. Eventually, we got it to a point where it was gonna take around two weeks. And so using the destination and the dates of the event as the center point, we then worked our way forward and backwards to establish the road trip. So we had all of our different stops in place and we knew where we needed to charge. So now we need hotel rooms. What I used was an app called PlugShare to try to find if there was any hotels in the areas that we wanted to stay that actually had charging available for us. That way we could start the day with a full charge. It would save time and a little bit of money. So we'd utilize that wherever possible. Once we had our hotel rooms booked, I put that back into ChatGPT, which gave us a really nice itinerary with some recommended stops along the way for points of interest, such as national parks, which was really cool. I took it another step further and I actually asked for some recommendations for breakfast as well as dinner. I didn't think we need recommendations for lunch since we'd be charging along the way and typically there's a lot of like fast food type places that we'd be able to uh, grab something quick. ChatGPT was using Yelp for its reviews so I asked for recommendations that are only 4.5 stars or higher to get the absolute best and as well we asked for recommendations in various price points and so what I got back was a list of of recommendations, three for each location with uh, varying price points, as well as a short description and the ranking. And so we were able to use that to really narrow things down. And in most of the areas we traveled, we actually used the recommendations from ChatGPT. We're really pleased with the results. Overall, using ChatGPT probably saved at least 10 hours of research. I shared the itinerary with friends and family and they were really impressed with what I came up with. And I did this all in just a couple of hours. So this took us through South Dakota, through the Black Hills, we got to see Devil's Tower. We drove through Wyoming, which was quite the drive, let me tell you. Up to the Yellowstone National Park, we saw Old Faithful, and we drove back down through Salt Lake City, Utah, down to Lake Tahoe, and then over to the event in California. So we didn't make it in in time for the scenic drive, but we feel like we saw plenty of scenery on the way. But we did participate in the largest light show. Uh, so this group from Austria actually coordinated this and lined up all the Teslas and we made a cyber truck and then it was set to music and everything. I'll put a link in the description if you guys want to check it out, but it was a pretty cool experience. And it was fun to hang out with fellow Tesla owners. The next day, of course, was the start of the event. We got there right away. They had a great kickoff that included information about their club and how the event got started. They had a little map that showed like all the different places that people have come from, from all over the world. People drove in from like Florida, Pennsylvania. We came from Minnesota. And obviously a ton of people from California were there as well. Tesla was there in full force with all four of their vehicles on display as well as the solar system with this little house that was set up with a battery backup and the charger and everything it was fully functional. I was a little bit disappointed they didn't bring the Cybertruck, but they did have some cool swag. There was a really cool modified Tesla competition. I got to run through that real quick, talk to a couple of the owners. They had sweet rides with the doors that go like this. A lot of them had really cool wraps, different rims, lighting. 
Some of them were a little bit over the top, uh, not to my taste, but uh, I really like the one from California with the fade and the palm trees on it. Uh, we got to meet those guys and they're really cool. Kim Java and Tesla Raj did a great presentation. She talked about her journey getting started with Tesla and how her YouTube channel took off. Now her and her husband are doing that full time. Actually got an opportunity to take a picture with her, which was a lot of fun. I'm not a big celebrity fanboy or anything, but I do like to get pictures with fellow YouTubers when I meet them at events like CES. Additionally, there was a number of other manufacturers vehicles there on display as well, including Ford, Lucid, Rivian, and an up and coming company, Aptera. We got these sweet shades. I've had a reservation for an Aptera for quite a while. I was a little bit worried when I saw the pricing come out and I wasn't sure if I was going to go forward with it and had some concerns about the space. So those that aren't familiar, the Aptera is a solar powered vehicle. It's actually an auto cycle, so it's got three wheels, but we had the opportunity to sit in it. You know, I thought it was really spacious and with the 40 or so miles of range that it will add each day uh, just off of the solar charging, I thought that was pretty cool. And, you know, I'm going to hold on to my reservation for now and see what the landscape looks like uh, closer to launch time. One of the presentations that we really enjoyed towards the end of the first day was Sandy Munro. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, Sandy is an engineer. He does uh, teardowns of, of cars. And so he was one of the first to tear down uh, any of the Teslas. And he's been very involved with Aptera. And so to hear him talk about, you know, what the other manufacturers were saying about Tesla and what their thoughts are now and his opinion on their versions of EVs and how far ahead Tesla is, it was really interesting to hear. Tesla is ahead by like five years in, in technology and batteries and motors in the charging infrastructure, the navigation. And then they also said full self-drive, which you know, I'm not really sold on the full self-drive quite yet. I had it on my first Model Y, and when I bought our next vehicle, I didn't end up purchasing it. So, you know, I feel like the price is a little bit high for what you get, and I kind of feel like they've uh, oversold that product for, you know, the current limitations. As we wrapped up the first day, they had a raffle, and Cassie actually won a scent wedge for her car, so that was pretty cool. The next day we got there for the intro again, but we actually decided to hit the road early, uh, so we didn't stick around for the remaining sessions. It was off to Vegas. So our route home took us through Las Vegas up to Zion, so we were able to check out the national park there. Over to Moab, where we saw the Arches National Park up through Colorado, we stayed in Breckenridge, and then on the way back, we made a final stop in Omaha. We got to have dinner with George and Teresa from Silver Hammer Surveillance. So if you haven't checked out that tour, I'll put it on screen here. In total, the trip was 5,449 miles round trip. We had 42 supercharging stops along the way, and on average, we were charging for about an hour every five to six hours of driving which isn't too bad if you think about it. In a traditional gas car, you're probably gonna stop every two to three hours anyways to go to the bathroom, get a bite to eat, fill your tank with gas, of course. And so while a lot of people are gonna say, well, it only takes me five minutes to fill up my tank, you're still going in and you know, grabbing snacks and hitting the restroom. And so if we divide up our charging, you're typically looking at about a 20 minute stop. And so for us, I don't think it was a really big deal. We planned our road trip out so that we really only have about six hours of driving each day. The great part about this trip was that I had enough supercharging miles uh, that it didn't actually cost us anything to charge the car. Uh, so we ended up using 3,908 supercharger miles and we're also able to charge for free in Jackson, Wyoming, as well as a couple of different national parks. And so that was a lot of great savings. Now, if we did have to pay for charging, I estimated the cost would be around $590, which actually isn't a lot of savings compared to a gas vehicle. If you were to get about 30 miles per gallon at today's rates of uh, about $3.90 per gallon, you're looking at around $708 for that same road trip. And so not a huge savings for driving an electric vehicle. But where you really do save is the overnight charging at your house. For me, I use off-peak. And so we're realizing huge savings for my day-to-day -day commutes. But I would still recommend an electric vehicle uh, for most road trips. Of course, there's gonna be instances where it might not be a really good fit. But for us, the navigation within the Tesla is phenomenal. We like having that really big screen. 
it automatically navigates you to the superchargers along the way. And so you don't actually have to think a lot about it. Unlike some other cars where the charging network might be not as reliable or it doesn't automatically navigate you, the Tesla does a really good job of just navigating in real time and making adjustments based on your current state of charge, what the capacity is at the upcoming charger. Even within the car, you can actually navigate to different chargers if you prefer. And then overnight, if you have the opportunity to plug in, uh, you're gonna have a full charge and be able to get to that next stop in the morning. One challenging part of the trip was actually Wyoming. We didn't have a charger in Cody, so we actually had to go around and we ended up making kind of like a U. So I had to go south and then west and then back up. And so we estimated that added about two hours to our trip overall, which is a little bit frustrating, but certainly not the end of the world. I think as time goes on and more chargers are added, that's gonna be really helpful. The other challenge that we've run into is that if you get to a supercharger, like an older one, the V2s that max out at 150 kilowatts, they actually share power. So if you had a V2 supercharger and you're sharing power with a car next to you, it can actually cut your speeds in half, which could be a little bit frustrating. But I think, you know, as electric vehicles become more popular, we're gonna see more charging options. Ideally, I think every 50 to 100 miles along the main interstates, just having a charging stop available, one that has like restrooms and some quick service food or convenience would be phenomenal. Me, personally, when I'm traveling, I like to stay low in the battery pack and do more frequent stops. That way we can get the fastest charging possible. So what I'll do is actually manually navigate to the V3 superchargers. These are ones that don't have that power sharing problem as well as they are faster. So it's 250 kilowatts. And so what I wanna do is roll in with about five to 10% estimated battery remaining and then charge up until I get to about 60% or just enough to get to the next supercharger with about a 5%, five to 10% buffer. And that way you're gonna maximize the charging speeds. As the battery starts to fill up, the charging speeds start to slow down. So at 60% and then 80%, uh, you're really going to start to notice it taper off and so i like to stay in the lower end that way i get those faster charging speeds and then you know i can just go to the next charger and start the process again some people are going to want to stay at the charger longer you know get above 80 percent and then have more of a buffer uh, but for me i just like to stay low in the pack and keep going as fast as i can the tesla does a great job of estimating how much range you have left we noticed that when we were going through the mountains uh, that it was actually predicting that we were going to come out with more uh, battery than what we started with and I just I couldn't believe it until it happened and so we started up at the top of the mountain and then we kind of made our way down and with the regenerative braking it was actually putting more energy back into the car and so we were able to drive like hundreds of miles and we only used like two percent battery so uh, that was a lot of fun you know coming out of Colorado going down those mountains. And the car is actually going to adjust for your speed. So I'm a guy that likes to drive a little bit faster, but also the car is constantly monitoring that and updating in real time based on your real usage. The North American charging standard, which is what Tesla is using, is far superior to the CCS network. It's much more reliable and easy to access. As more manufacturers start adopting the North America charging standard, I think that's going to be a more viable option, but for now, road tripping in an electric vehicle that isn't a Tesla could be challenging in certain parts of the country where their chargers aren't as readily available. Now, road tripping in an electric vehicle may not be for everyone. I think there's instances where, you know, if the vehicle style doesn't meet your family's needs, or if you're going to be towing or driving in the winter, it might not be the best fit for you. A traditional gas vehicle might be fine and it's okay you can still rent a vehicle for the limited times that you go on these out-of-state road trips and still have an electric vehicle at home or if you have more than one car you know, have your primary electric vehicle and then maybe you have a, a gas vehicle for backup for hauling things and for these longer road trips we had a great time on our trip the tesla takeover event was incredible we love seeing the national parks if you guys get an opportunity i highly recommend taking a road trip in an electric vehicle it's a great experience we love the tesla takeover we really enjoy road tripping in an electric vehicle. You know, I don't know that we're gonna go back to the takeover event just because we've, now we've already done that route and we've seen a lot of things, uh, but there's certainly stops along the way that we wanna go back to and revisit. But if there's another Tesla meetup or some other event in other parts of the country, 
I think we're definitely gonna plan another road trip in the future, maybe next year. Until next time, take care.